Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and you're very welcome back to the third and final session of the Signpost General Assembly. The title of this session is Carbon Storage and Methane. For the next um, hour and a quarter or so, we're going to focus in on key topics including carbon farming, carbon sequestration of our hedgerows, soil health, feed additives to reduce methane, multi-species swords, and we address the question of can we reduce aged slaughter. Any of you that were on the, on the interview last night or saw the interview with Frank Mara will see that Frank highlighted the importance of research and innovation in terms of providing additional technologies and other solutions to help reduce our emissions and help us re meet our targets over the next couple of years. So in this session, we have a nice blend of emerging research, old research, but also some practical tips and tricks to help farmers to reduce emissions. To introduce our panel firstly, so we, we are, we're delighted to be joined by two people from the French Livestock Institute based in Paris. So we'd like to welcome um, on screen um, Anne-Yves Lahot and um, Catherine Brocke. You're very welcome to our, our session this morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I would also like to welcome Lillian O'Sullivan. Lillian is a researcher based at, at Johnstown Castle working on carbon sequestration in hedgerows. And then Mark Plunkett, who probably needs no introduction to this audience. Um, Mark is a, a soil and plant nutritionist specialist um, with Chagask. So there are three presentations. First, we have six presentations in total, and we're breaking those down into three, two blocks of three. So we'll have short presentations followed by a Q&A, and then we'll move to the second, the second block of three. So our first presentation now will be by Anise. She's joined by our colleague, Catherine, who will be available for the Q&A session at the end of this. So Anise, over to you for the first presentation to talk about carbon farming. As we all know, the carbon farming um, is there has been a commitment at EU level and at national level to develop platforms or to develop frameworks for carbon farming that would allow farmers to be rewarded for taking climate friendly actions that are based on climate friendly outcomes. So the French um, Institute, or Livestock Institute, has done a considerable amount of work on this and has made considerable progress. I suppose we're starting off on this journey ourselves here in Ireland. Um, but there are lessons to be learned for Ireland from what is happening in France. So I'm going to pass you over to Anise now to start her presentation and give us, what, give us their account of the, the French experience of developing a carbon farming model. Thank you. Thank you, Anise. Thank you over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm Anna Islot uh, from the French Livestock Institute, and I will present you the Carbon Agri methodology, a low carbon label method for boosting low carbon initiative in the mix, mixed crops livestock sector. Uh, so uh, first, uh, in 2019, the uh, the French label Bas Carbon was created by the French Ministry of Environment. And it is a framework to certify a project that mitigate uh, greenhouse gases uh, in greenhouse gases in all the sectors, not only agriculture. It guarantees that these projects contribute to GAG mitigation in a transparent way to ver and thanks to verified methodology that have been approved by the French Ministry of Environment. This uh, methodology describes uh, how to determine a baseline and then how to assess GAG emissions. Among these methodologies, there is the carbon agri methodology for the dairy and beef sector and for crops too. The carbon agri methodology relies on the cap to tool, a tool developed by the French Livestock Institute to evaluate the carbon footprint on farms. So how does it work? Uh, the scope of this methodology is the old farm with all the production units. And the first step is to determine a baseline with the first carbon audit on farm. So thanks to uh, the cap to tool to assess the carbon footprint. Then the farmer and the advisor built a mitigation action plan uh, with the implementation of several best practices to reduce uh, GAG emissions and to increase the carbon sequestration. These practices are listed in the carbon agri methodology. So during the five years, these practices are implemented with a follow-up by the advisor. At the end of the five years, a second carbon audit is, com is completed with the cap 2 r tool and it certifies the number of tons equivalent CO2 avoided during the project. 
at the end, the farmer receives a financial rewarding uh, depending on the, the amount of CO2 uh, avoided. So as I said, the first step is to determine a baseline. Uh, so it's done with a carbon audit on farm with the CAPTOR tool, uh, and it evaluates uh, the GAG emissions and the carbon sequestration, and also the co-benefits such as biodiversity and nitrogen balance. The tool methodology is based on IPCC and the main guidelines, and it, it has been certified by an external auditor. Then uh, during the five years, so a mitigation action plan is uh, built uh, by the farmer and the advisor, and then it is implemented during the five years. And as I said, uh, mitigation practices are listed in the Carbon Agri methodology. There are 40 mitigation practices. Um, so in all the, the fields uh, of the farms, so uh, for example, reducing concentrates and fertilizers, to uh, plant uh, legume fodder uh, crops, cover crops, hedges, uh, or to increase productivity. Uh, these uh, practices enable uh, to uh, reduce carbon footprint up to 15 to 20 percent. So uh, it represent, represents on average to 300 to 400 tons CO2 on a five years period. Um, then you have the, the uh, so uh, you have the mitigation uh, action plans that have been uh, implemented, and the final uh, the GHG mitigation is uh, quantified by comparing the final situation and the um, the baseline that that was determined at the beginning of the project. Uh, so, um, the so the difference uh, gives the emissions uh, is the emission reduction and the increase of carbon sequestration during the five years of the project. Uh, the, there, there is a verification by an external auditor to certify that this uh, carbon footprint reductions had been achieved. Uh, so this external, external auditor sends a verification report based on supporting documents such as uh, bills, for example, or report of on-farm verification. And then the project is certified by the label Bas Carbon. Uh, what is France Carbon Agri Association? So it is the association uh, created by uh, Livestock Farmers Association uh, that uh, really makes the link between the project leaders. So for example, the advisor that takes in charge uh, several farmers and the buyers. Uh, and uh, for the first project uh, was accredited in 2021, including 300 farmers, and it represents 137,000 tons CO2 uh, reductions uh, all around the front. And to do it today, we are working on another one with uh, this time 900 farmers. At a European scale, uh, the Life Carbon Farming Project has been launched uh, in October this year uh, for six years. It is a European project uh, with uh, Ireland, uh, France as project leader, Germany, Belgium, Italy, and Spain. And uh, the goal is to elaborate harmonized tools and standards, and then implementing carbon farming initiative in 700 mixed, mixed crops livestock farms uh, in these countries. And in the same time, we will elaborate a carbon farming project referential costs. So how does it cost to implement best practices, but also how does it, how does it cost to, uh, to do this follow-up with the advisor and to, uh, to complete the carbon uh, audit on farms? So to conclude, um, Carbon Agri is an innovative mechanism for quantifying and certifying GHG reductions in agriculture with a robust monitoring, reporting, and verification system that is essential for the results-based approach. Uh, it is an innovative mechanism for developing a transparency, accounting, and communication to remove barriers in applying mitigation practices to support farmers in reducing 
uh, these emissions and increasing carbon sequestration and to mobilize innovative funds for local climate, climate actions. So it really is a mechanism for boosting low carbon initiatives and moving to net zero carbon. Thank you for your attention. Anise, thank you very much for that. And we'll be back to you later on in the, in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. As you can see from that presentation from Anise, there's been considerable pro pro progress made in fr France to implement a carbon farming model. And as Anise said at the end, the key target really is to, to help or assist farmers in, in adopting mitigation actions to reduce carbon emissions and also to sequester carbon. So there are lessons to be learned from what's happening in France and we'll come back and um, there will be questions for Anise in, in relation to where we might um, position ourselves in, in addressing this in Ireland. We'll move on now to our second presentation. Our second presentation comes from Lillian O'Sullivan. Lillian is a researcher based at Johnstown Castle, working on carbon sequ sequestration in our hedgerows. And this isn't, oh, this isn't very new work. This work actually has been gone on since 2010 by our colleagues at Johnstown Castle. But um, Lillian is coming very close to finishing um, a rather large project in this particular area. And Lillian is here to give us an update on where that's at, but also to provide the signpost farmers that are in the audience today with practical advice around how do you optimize the biomass in your hedgerows or on your farms to try and maximize carbon sequestration. So Lillian, over to you. Thank you very much, Siobhan. Uh, so today, as Siobhan indicated, I'm going to talk a bit about the research that has been going on in relation to hedgerows. So of course, we're all aware we have some serious targets that need to be met. Uh, including those outlined in the Climate Action Plan 2021. And in that, we can see some specific references made in relation to hedgerows and actions pertaining to agriculture, but also the land use, land use change and forestry sector. So the Lulu CF, uh, Lulu CF sector. Okay, so uh, carbon sequestration, of course, that's the process of taking atmospheric carbon dioxide and utilizing it to grow plant biomass crops and to be stored in biomass and also into the soil. And of course, hedges uh, store carbon in the woody biomass and in the leaves, but also in the roots and in the soil uh, underneath that hedgerows. So of course, ecosystems that sequester more carbon dioxide than they emit are sinks, but conversely, those that emit more than they sequester are carbon sources. And I think it's important to point out that here in Ireland, year on year, our Lulu CF sector has been a source of emissions, um, which is quite different uh, to most other EU states. But I suppose the positive out of that is that, of course, carbon sequestration uh, can be harnessed and can help to balance our greenhouse gas emissions. And already in Ireland, we do have the marginal abatement cost curve uh, for land use measures um, that can help indicate or identify ways uh, by which we can use that land base to, to harness uh, carbon sequestration and, and, try and, and try and reverse these emissions and, and, and increase that sink potential. Um, but yeah, as Siobhan says, hedgerow research is not new, in, um, certainly in Chagask. Um, I, I must point out, of course, that most of the research to date, a lot of that has been done by our colleagues actually in Ashtown in terms of uh, the work that's been done in relation to the land use budgets. Of course, there's a lot of work in, in biodiversity in other areas, but primarily the work in relation to carbon um, has been done by our colleagues in Ashtown. And to be able to, to include hedgerows in our budgets, we need to know the amount of carbon stored in hedgerows nationally and also to be able to provide an annual sequestration uh, figure. So to answer these questions, we need to know the extent, the size. So again, what are the biophysical um, makeup of our hedgerows, their width, their height, uh, the type, are they managed, very managed, cut right back, or are they allowed to accumulate more, more biomass? Are there trees, are they new old? And of course, what is the typical amount of carbon stored in a hedgerow? So in relation to extent, um, we have some, uh, the first early work in that uh, space. We had the first map in 2011, the Tagus Hedgerow map. But of course, we know there's been a lot of technological progress in terms of being able to calculate remotely um, the biomass in our hedgerows. And in 2012, LIDAR uh, scanning, a project based on LIDAR scanning, um, showed that this was a really excellent technique to successfully estimate the biomass that we have in our hedgerows. 
And so utilizing um, the outcomes from that work and uh, using published, previously published models, uh, we have the, the standard estimates that we utilize at the moment in relation to hedgerow sequestration. So currently it's a wide range between 0.66 and 3.3 tonnes of CO2 per hectare per annum. And if we scale that up uh, to the national aggregate scale, we're talking about one, up to 1.1 megatons of CO2 per year. Um, of course, LIDAR is expensive, so um, we wanted to see then were there other alternatives and what we found, uh, or our colleagues um, in the FERS and our colleagues in Ashton found, is that actually um, radar wasn't a sufficiently suitable technique for accurately measuring biomass. Um, so either drone required or, or other unmanned air vehicle or LIDAR, uh, but it could detect uh, hedgerow removals and while we do have a lot of hedgerows in Ireland we have about 680,000 kilometers as uh, some net removals uh, were detected based on um, you know analysis of aerial photographic records uh, but I suppose one of the more positive things with that is that uh, the research indicates that the rate of decline um, slowed down very much in the latter half of that period but of course, again, um, you know, it called again that research for some direct measurements of hedgerow biomass. And this is, of course, where uh, the work that we are currently doing uh, within the Farm Carbon Project comes in. So what we're doing in this research is we are calculating the carbon stock of measured biomass from selected hedgerows. So really trying to capture the range with respect to management intensity. So very, very managed to, to much um, lesser management, if you like, and then relate um, the volume measurements uh, captured using remote technology um, to a carbon stock. So, this has not been done here before, um, but ultimately what we would like to be able to do then is say that, okay, well, a change in a biomass volume indicates a change in carbon stock. And also we are developing an integrated scorecard for best management practices and uh, other ecosystem services. So uh, just briefly, I won't go into the graph, but of course, as, as mentioned by the first speaker, uh, we need to know the carbon pools for the different pools as, as specified under the IPCC. So, of course, there's quite a lot of separation of hedgerow to be able uh, to do that. So, of course, of interest to you at home maybe is, how, well, how can I increase carbon sequestration? So, ultimately, it boils down really to this whole idea of being able to increase your biomass. So, allowing accumulation um, of that because, of course, your management regime is going to impact that density. So, if you over trim, it's going to limit your accumulation, but also it induces gappiness. Um, width is shown to be a key, um, a key factor in increasing the capacity to sequester carbon. And of course, if you have trees in the boundary, then that's going to be a, a greater uh, carbon store in your above ground. Um, finally, in terms of soils under hedgerow um, on croplands, um, this was shown to have an increase relative to that uh, land use. Um, but it will be interesting to see what we find in terms of the soils relative to the, the grasslands that we've also looked at in the current project. So just to summarize, um, the land sector, it's currently an emission source, but of course there are ways and means and managements that can enhance the sink potential in terms of our soil and our biomass management. Estimates are a means to quantify the extent um, of hedgerows have been trialed. We know how best to do that, uh, but now we're working to refine our models for hedgerow. Um, options to enhance sequestration exist. And just to leave you with the fact that, of course, hedgerows, they're not only important from a carbon regulation perspective, but also they have many, many other important ecosystem service benefits at a farm level. Thank you very much. Back to you, Siobhan. OK, thank you very much, Lillian. I think that presentation is, is, is very encouraging that we, we have some very good work coming out of Johnstown Castle. And I'm sorry I didn't mention the, the Ashdown work, um, that we will have a model there that will accurately post the estimates on, accurately uh, measure what, what is sequestered in our hedgerows. Because I know it is an area that's frustrating to farmers, that they're maybe not getting credit for what's in their hedgerows right now, but we need data to be able to do that. And I think Lillian has highlighted some of the management practices that farmers can take to try and manage their, their biomass on farm so that they can maximise sequestration. 
um, over the next couple of years. And there may not be the rewards there for it now, but if you put in the foundations now, hopefully the potential is there to get the rewards for that in terms of offsetting carbon um, down the line in the next couple of years. Our second present, or our final presentation, sorry, in this session is on practical tips to manage soil health. Um, and this is going to be presented by Mark Plunkett, who is our soil and plant nutrition specialist in the organisation. Um, this has become, or, or it is a really important area. It's fundamental to everything we do, whether it's animal or crop production. It is fundamental to everything that, that we do in terms of producing um, um, milk and meat and crops, but also in terms of trying to sequester carbon over the next number of years to meet our, our climate action our, um, plan targets. Um, Mark will deal with the main components of, of our, our soil health. It, traditionally, we've always talked about the nutrient content. Now we're looking more at the biology and soil structure and trying to get a better understanding of those so that we can optimise the production and the carbon sequestration potential of our soil. So, Mark, over to you for the final presentation. Uh, th thanks, Siobhan, and, and good morning, everybody. This, this afternoon, I'm going to have a look at uh, the whole area of um, the steps that we can take to Im improve soil health, both on, on tillage and grassland farms. And yes, Siobhan is right. Um, we very much focus around soil fertility, but this morning hopefully I will give you an insight into looking and assessing um, soil structure and, and thinking about soil health. So if we think about soil health, and look, I've looked at many definitions over the last number of days, but again, soils have many functions. And again, a key function is, is food production, fiber production, and energy production. Also, soils are a massive store of nutrients. So again, there's a big, I suppose, a big volume of nutrients in our soils, and I suppose that's what we have been trying to do over the years in terms of improving soil fertility is to improve the availability of those nutrients. And also we must remember this, our soils have a major function in the cycling and the turnover of nutrients as in slurry and organic manures. Also our soils purify and store water and we're trying to build in resilience into our soils in terms of whether it's you know big rainfall events or drought events in terms of having enough water to supply our crops during the growing season. Soils also, you know, they perform a function in terms of weed and pest management. And very importantly, they store a lot of carbon. So again, it's very important that we get an understanding of that carbon and we try to build that carbon going forward. And also, they're a, a massive um, reservoir of uh, soil life and soil biodiversity as well. So again, if we think about soil health, um, I suppose simply, there's, if you think of a stool, there's three legs to a, health, a, you know, a healthy soil. Number one is soil structure. Number two is soil fertility, which we think and talk a lot about. And number three is soil biology, which we probably don't focus enough on. Soil biology has a key role to play in healthy soils. And again, I've brought in those little plumes of organic matter or soil carbon. So that's a natural glue that you know, gives soil structure, gives it function. It's like the cement in, in, the, in the, the walls and the buildings around us here this morning. So that's very, very important to good soil function. So in terms of assessing soil structure, um, my, my research colleagues, both in Johnstown Castle and here at, at Oak Park, have developed methods uh, for assessing soil structure or looking to see is there soil compaction or any damage to those soils. So the first one there is what we, we call the grass vest. And again, we're looking at the top 25 centimetres of soil. We look at things like the root mat, and then we assess the soil for things like the, the, the size and shape of the aggregates, the, the rooting, the colour of those soils. You know, is there, is there um, you know, water... Um, you know, stagnation on those soils. Um, and also in the arrows there on, on the picture there, we look to see is there maybe a little bit of compaction, whether some poaching or for machinery. On the tillage side, again, we assess the top half meter of soils. We look at the plough layer and also the, the soil below it. So we're looking at the top 25 centimetres. Again, we assess the soil in terms of the quality of that soil, in terms of you know, the shape, the size of the aggregates, how much rooting, things like smell and colour. And also then we assess the next um, 25 centimetres just on the top of the subsoil. And in between, there's a layer there. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a zone for examination. You know, on a plough-based system, that's the cultivation layer, the cultivation zone. And there may be compaction there. So it is important when you take out, dig out your soil to look at that layer. And some simple things as rooting, you know, the presence of roots, you know, are the roots going vertically down or are they going horizontally? And again, you know, that's, that will give you a very good indication to see is there a problem with compaction or maybe what remediation is required on that soil. So in terms of, say, managing or maintaining good soil structure or good soil, soil health, um, on grassland soils is very much around trafficability. So again, you know, 
you know, when it comes to the to, to this to the application of slurry in springtime, like our soil is fit to take that that equipment, which has now got very, very heavy, or come silage harvest. You know, is soil trafficability good? What's the soil moisture deficits? Do we need to delay the harvest or the spreading of slurry by a day or two to ensure that we're not damaging the soils? Also, grazing conditions. You know, grazing intensity has, has increased on, on, on intensive livestock farms. So again, it's in the shoulders of the year, early spring and late in the autumn. So again, when we let our animals out to graze, you know what I mean, our soil conditions good. And if you do find that there is, you know, say poaching damage in fields, like a, a good remedial action there is using farmyard manure, targeting, targeting it to the paddock that got poached or maybe the headland got, that got poached. On the tillage side of the house, again, again, it's back to field conditions, soil moisture conditions, um, and again, man, managing heavy field operations, whether it's plowing, sowing, harvesting crops. In terms of remediation, we have, you know, well-proven measures there, like organic manures are, again, a welcomed um, source of you know carbon, organic matter, and nutrients on tillage soils, and big big bring big benefits in terms of improving soil structure. Also, things like cover cropping. Again, that we have a you know we have a, a crop in the ground nearly every day of the year. That's the root system there. It gives soil structure, and also you're adding valuable carbon to the soils there as well. The other area that we're very familiar with is soil fertility, and I think here it's very very important in terms of nutrient balance that we soil test. We correct soil pH, you know, we, we, we look at our carbon levels, our organic matter levels, and also we maintain uh, soil fertility levels as well. And again, that's very much back to nutrient deficiency. If you take something as simple as, as lime, again, has been discussed here, here this morning, again, it increases soil P avail availability, which is very important in terms of, of rooting and the productivity of our soils. In terms of getting nutrient balance, and balance right, it's very much back to fertilizer planning, having a lime plan, having a plan for organic manures, and then a fertilizer program to, to ensure there's balance in terms of our major nutrients. The final one there is soil biology. So again, it's very, very important. It's the engine, it's the life of our soils. So again, you know, it's a, a very good indication of a healthy soil. And, and in the, a simple indicator there is earthworm numbers. Again, a recent, some recent work that we've done on, on the Better Farms program there, we had three farms, the first two farms there, they, they use very little organic manures, but our third farmer had a long history of using organic manures, and the earthworm numbers went from some like 200 per cubic meter up to 500 per, per cubic meter. And even to walk into those fields, you could see the, the castings on the ground, you could see the, the fields were drier, you could also see the, the earthworms where they, where they were burrowing, and again, numbers were very, very large. The biology, again, I can't overemphasize the importance of it in terms of nutrient cycling, nitrogen fixation, pathogen suppression, and also soil drainage and aeration. So in terms of feeding the biology on a, on a grassland farm, we have good access to organic manures, farmyard manure, cattle slurry, targeting those to, to the areas that, you know, maybe there has been some soil compaction. Also things like multi-species swards, you know, king or diversity is king. On the tillage side of the house, we have, we have cover crops, we can also chop straw and organic manures. And that's very much putting a food source you know, into the soil for the biology to feed on and grow that biology. So in, in summary, Siobhan, I would say it's very, very important that we take the spade out. You know, we do a grass vest or we do a double spade to see what the quality of our soil is. Is there an issue in terms of soil compaction? And then we, you know, we put a, a, a mitigation strategy, whether it's targeting farmyard manure, using slurry efficiently, or on the tillage side, there's many options there from chopping straw to cover cropping. So with that, I, I leave it at that, Siobhan. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. You can come back, back onto the panel now. The main point I would take from Mark's presentation is the three-legged stool, that soil health is, is the nutrient content, it's the biology, and it's the structure of it. And I suppose the action out of, of Mark's presentation is to get, act, get out and actually do an assessment of your farm and, and look at soil structure and look at the biology of, the, 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 of, of your soil and to try and optimise the, the soil health. Um, can I please encourage you to submit your questions in the Q&A function on, on Zoom? Um, we will have a small panel discussion. This is kind of a quick fire session, so um, we will be taking questions related to three, three speakers now, but when we move on to the other three speakers, we won't be coming back to this session as well. So I would encourage you to, um, to submit your questions um, and now if you can at all possible. So I'll ask Anise and, and Catherine to come back on screen, please. So Anise is joined by her colleague, Catherine, who is also a project manager with the Life Carbon Farming Project in France. And um, it should be coming back on screen any minute now. Hi, Anise. Hi, Catherine. Hi. Hi. 
Okay, I'll, I'll go to you, Anis, with the, with the first question. And I suppose uh, the farmers on, on, the, on the webinar this morning will be curious to know what is carbon price at the, mo at the moment and what kind of um, quantities are, are farmers or what kind of sums of money are farmers getting in, under this project, under the Carbon Farmer project? So in the project that have, has just been accredited, uh, the amount of the carbon credit is 38 euros per ton CO2. Uh, so 30 euros uh, for the farmer, um, 5 euros for the project leader, uh, for example, the advisor, and 3 euros for France Carbon Agri Association, so the association that makes the link between the buyers and the project leaders. Uh, so it, um, it represents, uh, on average, 9,000 uh, to 15,000 euros per farm uh, in a five-year period. And uh, these carbon credits are sold to uh, public and private organizations uh, such as uh, Chanel, Kering, or uh, cities like Paris for the Ol Olympic Games uh, to compensate or to contribute to uh, carbon farming, uh, so to GAG mitigation project in agriculture. Okay. You might tell us a little bit more, Anis, about the, the organization that's that's linking the farmer with the, the organization that's buying the, the credits? So the, the, the fear was that, uh, for example, downstream companies such as Danone, uh, for example, speculate on uh, these carbon credits. And uh, the aim was really that the farmers uh, themselves manage uh, the, the carbon credits and the, uh, the financial contribution they, they get from it. Uh, so that's why France Carbon Agri Association uh, was created by uh, livestock farmers uh, associations to make sure that they really manage all the, all the process of this carbon credit. Okay, all right, thank you. Catherine, I'm going to ask you a question. Like we're starting out in this process. The Climate Action Plan 2021 has highlighted that we, we are, have commi has committed to implementing a framework here for carbon farming. What are the lessons learned from your experience in France that are relevant to us here in Ireland? Um, what is relevant? Um, we need uh, to, to implement, uh, we need a um, good advisor uh, because uh, to construct uh, action plan, uh, we need an advisor which know how to feed the cow, uh, how to feed the crop uh, and uh, to have a large, uh, um, uh, large uh, vision of the farm and to propose a good uh, action plan to the farmer. And actually in France, we have a very specialist advisor. So uh, uh, one advisor know very, uh, know very well to feed the cow, but he don't know how to uh, feed the crop. Uh, so uh, we need very good advisor with large competence uh, to to, to advise farmers. Uh, that's the first point. Um, and we need farmers which are uh, motivated uh, to, to, to implement a carbon pl uh, action plan uh, on farms. Uh, that's the second uh, point, uh, which is very important. Um, yes, and perhaps you can add something, uh, Anais. Uh, well, I think you, you said the, the, the major points. Uh, indeed, it's really important that the farmers are motivated too, and that uh, it's not, uh, for example, an idea of the advisor to, uh, to make the farmer participate in this project. If the farmers is not highly motivated, uh, the, 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 the benefits for him uh, will be uh, will be uh, quite uh, uh, quite low. So you have to be very uh, very uh, uh, to really watch this uh, this factor. Yeah, and I suppose that's logical. If the farmer is not motivated to be involved in this kind of a project, you're not going to get the actions taken, and you're not going to get the end results. So thank you very much for that, Lillian. There's a question in here for for you on. The, the figures that you presented show the huge variation in sequestration in hedgerows. Can you just maybe comment on that a little bit? Yeah, so um, those figures are based on, well, very accurate biomass measurements, but uh, because we have not had any previous uh, hedgerow model, if you like, 
developed. Uh, the models used were um, forestry published models where effectively the hedgerow is looked at as a tree. So um, one, the, uh, the higher estimate effectively looks at um, hedgerow, uh, hedgerows to be um, accumulating biomass year on year on year on year. Yeah. Um, so potentially is an overestimate because mm. we know that it's not linear in yeah. that way. Yeah. Um, whereas the other model does allow for mortality rates, etc. But of course, what we are trying to do in this current project is to uh, refine those estimates by actually taking direct measurements of hedgerows um, that will be more accurate and should certainly narrow that range considerably. Okay. And is there much of a variation between species, different species in, in hedgerows? Uh, well, I suppose from the purpose of accounting, um, you know, you need to be able to assess carbon stock change at national level. Mm -hmm. So within the scope of a project that's only two years, the, the, the capacity in the first instance to be able to assess that uh, at individual species level is not there. However, what I would say is that research in the UK has shown us that there is no um, benefit to species level, species level okay. disaggregation, that that number on aggregate doesn't necessarily change. And I suppose we would also know from other research that you know, carbon, um, you know, carbon and dry biomass, wood biomass doesn't vary massively. It's about 48, well, it is 48% in, in Hawthorns in, in research in the UK, which of course is similar climate. But by and large, you're talking somewhere between the 44 to 55 is the global uh, estimate. So, um, but yeah, of course, depending on what you want to do, I suppose, um, you know, sometimes people will think about faster growing species for more rapid accumulation, et cetera. And there are different stages in the life cycles of trees um, where, you know, that period of growth is more rapid yeah. and then yeah. levels off. Okay. How does, there's a question in here, how, what's the best way to examine and do an assessment of the biomass on your farm? So can farmers do that themselves? Um, well, I suppose that's part of the work as well that we're looking towards developing is a scorecard that allows you to do rapid assessments. I suppose for accurate measurements, you're going to need something more uh, like the remote measurements uh, where you get real strong figures. But I suppose um, certainly, um, you know, there is guidance about infield determination of width. I suppose it's important to mention that when you're talking about hedgerow stocks and carbon stocks and generally they're presented on a per hectare basis. So uh, you need to know roughly the length and then um, the average width and then you can calculate your, your area extent from that. And of course, if you know, when we have the hectare uh, level values, it'll be easier then, of course, to, I suppose, interpolate. But I suppose in our model, what we're also trying to account for is um, space, so gappiness in the yeah, hedgerow, yeah. you see, and sometimes uh, that can get lost if you're looking at just mm. canopy, etc. But certainly, yeah, we can certainly move towards a better estimation of that in field, and, and we're developing a scorecard to support that. Okay, okay. Mark, a few questions in for you, for you. Specifically, how does a farmer improve the soil biology and the earthworm counting on, on, in soil? Um, I, I suppose feeding the, the soil, again, um, if you take, you know, in terms of a tillage situation, it's probably a bit more clear cut. So again, if you can put, bring in organic matter, things like cover cropping, you know, once you can put a, a food source, you know what I mean, yeah. into the soil or on the surface, you know what I mean, you're, you're going to increase those, um, those numbers. As, as I showed you, there was a graph there from the Better Farms programme. Uh, John Collins in, in County Waterford was using poultry manures for 10, 15 years. And again, there was a, a large volume of earthworms there. So and, and the, like even in the grassland farm, Siobhan, if there's a headland that has been damaged, like farmyard manure is very limited on, on livestock farms, yeah. but targeting that farmyard manure to that headland or a gateway or a, a paddock that was damaged from poaching, you know what I mean? You will encourage that soil or promote soil biology which is, has a, has a mass, massive role and function in soils, you know, whether it's production or water purification or nutrient cycling. Um, you know, it, 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 is, it is something that you can do and measure quite easily. Okay, like. okay. There's a question in here from Ron, Ronald. Does spreading too much slurry at one time affect or damage soil structure or soil biology? So a lot of slurry going out at the one yeah, time. Yeah, so look, in terms of application rate, like we're, we're probably talking maybe two and a half, three thousand gallons in, in, in a single application. And again, very, very important is soil conditions. You know, equipment now has got, has got bigger. Tractors have got, you know, more horsepower, they're heavier. So again, yes, soil conditions at time of application is, is paramount. Like it could be something as simple as maybe waiting a day or two until soils dry out. And just one final question then again, Mark, this is to you. What's the best time of the year to do a soil um, structure assessment? Generally, the best time to get out the spade and go digging is generally August, September time. 
You know what I mean? Okay. Again, there's procedures there. There's a, a small booklet developed. Um, it's called the ABC it's style of structure. It, it's on the Chagas website. And again, it'll give you practical guidelines. You know, it's often good to go into a good area and a poor area and do a dig and just get your eye in as regards what you should be seeing mm. in those areas. OK. All right, Mark, thank you very much for that. Yeah. So we're, unfortunately, we're going to have to draw this part of session three to a close. Um, I want to thank, thank our three spe four speakers, sorry, Annie East, Catherine, Lillian and Mark for their presentations. I know it has been a quick fire session, but that, that's, that's what we had planned for just short presentations. All these presentations will be available um, on our website and, and through social media over, over the next short while. Um, and I would encourage you to, to look back on them, spe specifically on the presentations that are, are of most relevance to you. Just to sum up and move on to, to session to, to before we move on to the, the final part of this session, um, the, the three presentations, one in terms of carbon farming, we're really only starting out on this road in terms of carbon farming um, and there's been a considerable amount of progress made in, in France and, and you can see the stages of that. There's the initial basic base, baseline establishment of, of what's happening on the farm, there's the implementation of the mitigation actions, then there's a review or an assessment of, of what's happening on the farm in terms of carbon removals and, and mitigation actions and the progress they've made. And then there's the verification um, and certification process. So there's a good few stages to it. And I suppose we'll be working on that over the next short while as a, as a, as a country to try and come up with that kind of a model. Um, but there will be lessons to be learned from what's happening in, in France. Secondly, Lillian focused in on, on um, sequestration uh, in our hedgerows. And there, there is potential for farmers to improve the biomass on, if, on their hedgerows to optimise soil or, or hedgerow sequestration over the next couple of years. And, and the reward for that will come in terms of off offsetting some of our carbon. And then finally, Mark's main message really was to get out and do a soil, soil health analysis, particularly around structure and, and biology. So we'll be, we'll be hoping you'll get out with the spades in the next short while to do just that. Moving on to the second part of our session, again, we have three short presentations followed by a Q&A. So again, I'd encourage you to put in your questions um, for that Q&A session, that short session at the end. I want to welcome our three speakers to the studio um, and ask Eddie to put on his, Eddie O'Riordan to put on his, his camera. So our three speakers in this session are uh, Professor Sinead Waters, um, who is a researcher with, with Chagas working on um, solutions to reducing methane emissions in, in, in livestock and specifically today to talk about feed additives. Secondly, we have Brendan Horn and Brendan is a researcher based at Moorpark and Brendan will give us the experiences of using mixed species swords at um, Curtin's farm um, in Cork. Um, recently established but it's an update and some preliminary results on that and some practical advice for farmers that are, are going that, down that road and then finally we don't have Eddie on screen here but Eddie O'Riordan is joining us from um, from Grange um, Eddie is standing in for Paul Crossan who unfortunately couldn't make it today so we want to thank Eddie for agreeing to participate Eddie was actually on um, on holidays this week and agreed kindly to stand in for, for, for um, Paul so to get the session going, um, our first speaker is Professor Sinead Waters and Sinead is going to give us an update on where the feed additives work are right now. There's a lot of talk about this, there's a lot of claims, headlines that we see in the media about feed additives, but it's good to get the, the science um, and accurate science on what's happening um, with these feed additives. They do offer the potential to re reduce our methane emissions, but to exact, exactly what extent and what progress has been made, I'm going to pass you over to Sinead now. So Sinead, thank you very much. Um, I'm glad to be here today uh, to talk to the signpost farmers because it's the signpost farmers that are going to be really crucial to delivering on the challenges that lie ahead in terms of meeting our targets, in terms of our climate ambitions. So today, as Siobhan said, I'm going to talk about methane emissions. So what is methane emissions? And how can we uh, reduce methane emissions from agriculture and really learn about some of the role of the feed additives um, as part of that? So methane emissions, uh, we know that agriculture is responsible for about 30%, 37% of Ireland's greenhouse gas emissions. Now methane is a really important uh, part of, of the greenhouse gas emissions and it contributes the most in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, about 60% of our emissions. So sources of methane include uh, enteric fermentation or feed digestion, which is about 56%. And then another source is the stored slurries and manures at about 10%. We are here in Ireland under international and national 
um, uh, legislation and commitments to meet our targets. And particularly here in Ireland, we're under the Climate Action and Low Carbon Development Bill. This sets out, set out there in November of this year, that we must reduce uh, our agri emissions by about 22 and 23 and, and 30 percent uh, based on our 2018 uh, figures by 2030. So how is methane emissions produced? So it's produced in the rumen or the belly of the animal, and it's produced during a process of, of fermentation or during feed digestion. And that process is called methanogenesis. So methane emissions is produced when the feed is ingested by the animal uh, and bacteria in the rumen then break down the feed, which is a very beneficial process so we can get the nutrients from the feed. But during that process, because it's an anaerobic environment, we basically, the, the, nit the uh, hydrogen and the carbon dioxide combine to produce uh, methane emissions. This also, uh, it, this is the CO2 plus the hydrogen combines to make methane and water in the rumen and that methane is emitted from the animal. This is also a very inefficient process because it takes energy to produce methane. So this results in a two, between a 2 and a 12% loss uh, of feed energy from the animal that could be used otherwise for productive processes. So the big question is, how are we going to reduce methane emissions from agriculture in Ireland? Now, the first way to do this is to follow the advice uh, in the signpost farms uh, and to use the measures laid out in the Chagas Mac. And Lillian mentioned it and others today and yesterday. And this is really to improve your management practices and enhance farm efficiency. We're also now developing new technologies because we won't meet our targets with this alone in terms of methane emissions and other greenhouse gases. So we're also working behind the scenes on generating new breeding strategies. So Chagas are working hand in hand with the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation to try and breed animals with a lower methane output while maintaining all the other productivity in the animals. We're also looking at feeding strategies. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. Uh, and as part of that, we will hear later about, about clover and other types of forages, but feed additives are going to be a, play an important role also. But we need to make sure that these feed additives work on Irish farms, and we need to make sure that the claims that the companies make are actually real, and we need more information on how they can be delivered, particularly on pasture-based systems. So that's the research we are doing in a project called Methabate. And this is funded by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marines. Uh, it started at the end of 2019, and this project sets out to look at, to develop novel farm ready technologies to reduce methane emissions from pasture based Irish agricultural systems. So within this project, we're looking to mitigate methane emissions. So assessing the feed additive, can it mitigate or lower methane emissions? While at the same time, we're going to monitor its effect on animal productivity. So there's no point in having an effect of feed additives if it actually lowers the productivity uh, in sheep and cattle. Some of the feed additives we're going to look at include Bovair or 3NOP, as we've heard a lot about uh, in the media. It's one of the most uh, feed additives further along in terms of its research. Look at seaweeds, oils, halides, uh, supplements like yucca, and of course, olive feeds and oils. So a lot of feed additives that are being developed can only be applied in indoor systems because the feed additives need to be with the feed at all times in order for it to be effective. That's why we need to develop encapsulated forms or slow release options so that these feed additives can be delivered at pasture. And some companies are working to that effect and including ourselves in the laboratory uh, in Chagas Grange. We also need to assess nutritional and the toxicological composition of the meat and milk that's produced from the animals afterwards, because we need to make sure that the products that we produce, meat and milk, are, have, have, have got consumer safety in mind and that there's no residues. And this is particularly true for things like, like seaweed, when you hear about bromoform and iodine, of course. Also, we need to make sure that they're produced sustainably. And this is why these feed additives and the trials that we do will be analyzed through the, the Chagas life cycle analysis models. And of course, they need to be cost effective. Margins are very tight, so they need to be farm level, cost effectiveness needs to be evaluated through the National Farm Survey. So we're looking at a range of feed additives, plant and oil extracts, olive feed products, short-lived reactive oxygen halide species, a range of seaweeds, browns, reds and greens, and seaweed extracts uh, through a project, Sea Solutions, as well as our own Methabate project. And we have a lot of companies involved, we have about eight uh, industry partners in this project. And we're in the process, and we've, we're nearly finished with this, by analysing these feed additives in a, a, what we call a Russi tech system, or it's a rumen simulated technique. So it's like bringing the rumen into the laboratory, we're using rumen fluid in that process, and we have fermenters set out where we assess the feed additives. We're also uh, looking at 3NOP, 
which is, you hear an awful lot about this feed additive. And this is a chemical where we're looking at, it's a non-toxic compound. Uh, and basically we've seen a lot of positive effects of this feed additive in trials across the world, where it's reducing uh, methane emissions by about 30%. This, we know the method of action, it, it binds to an enzyme in the methanogen species, and we see positive effects of this in in vitro and in animal studies. And the productive performance of the animals is not compromised. We're also currently doing a trial on 3NOP in Chagos Grange, and we'll hopefully have results from this in the spring. But also there's issues around, we we'll have to uh, communicate with our farmers around uh, pasture-based systems and being able to use 3 NOP, a pasture-based system, so they're trying to develop a slow-release option for this, and also consumer acceptability. Um, so that means, you know, how can we get around this, this idea of, of, of feeding a chemical in a diet? Um, we need to get this communication around that is actually that there's no residues at the end of it. We're doing a range of animal trials in sheep, in beef, uh, and in dairy cattle. Uh, assessing these uh, feed additives um, uh, using a range of methodologies to measure the methane, including pack chambers, the green feed system, and of course outdoor green feed, si feed systems at pasture. We're also looking at early life intervention. So we, we're interested in the whole concept of altering the rumen microbes, the microbes rumen in early life, and these having sustained effects throughout the lifetime of the animal. So we're looking at what is the optimum time frame for manipulation of the rumen. So the first month of life presents a, very, a time frame which during which the rumen microbiome becomes established. So these methanogens become established in the rumen at this time. So we're looking at, is there lasting effects of the rumen functionality, including the methanogens, that can last into later life? There was a study from France, from INRA, looking at early life administration of, of 3NOP to dairy calves uh, from birth to 14 weeks of life, which is a very promising study where we see reductions in methane emissions which persisted up to 12 months of age. And we're going to repeat this study um, in Grange uh, next year and try and see if we get similar results in, in, in Irish cattle. And this study resulted in a cumulative reduction in around 150 kilograms of CO2 equivalents per head during the first year of life. And just to summarise, methane is a potent uh, agricultural greenhouse gas. We're under national and international commitments to reduce it significantly. We have some promising feed additives that are being assessed using a systematic approach for methane mitigation. And slow release will be a, a promising application at grazing and there's potential for early life intervention. So thank you, Siobhan. All right, thanks very much, Sinead, for that. As you can see from Sinead's pre um, presentation, there's a lot of work going on in this, this area, um, looking at feed additives. One of the biggest challenges is to find a feed additive that will work in a grazing system and that will give an impact in terms of reducing, reducing methane emissions. It is probably one of our most challenging areas is to reduce methane emissions on, on farms. So this is promising work, but we're looking at a couple of years down the line. So, but I think it's really important to emphasize what Sinead said at the, at the beginning, that we need to implement the MAC, MAC actions now and hope that science and technology will provide us with additional solutions down the line. And I think we are being given that space in the Climate Action Plan to implement the current technologies and to give science and technology space to, to, to catch up and, and provide us with additional solutions. Okay, I'm going to move on to our final presentation. Our final presentation has been made by Brendan Horn from Moorpark, and it's on preliminary results from the use of multi-species swords at Curtin's uh, farm in, in Cork. And as we know from the Climate Action Plan 2021, we have been asked to, or one of the targets is to reduce chemical end usage by 20% over the next um, number of years. And this is one of the ways of doing that. So Brendan is going to present um, the preliminary findings from this work at, at Curtins, and there's also work ongoing at, at um, Johnstown Castle also in this area. So Brendan, over to you, thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Just in terms of, I suppose, the introduction to this uh, uh, increasing sward diversity, we have projects now across dairy, beef and sheep, and there are a large number of collaborators on this project, which is focused on low end dairy systems. And also just to acknowledge that this is a core funded project using dairy levy funding. I guess the context Siobhan has outlined, there is three big policy frameworks which are, I suppose, motivating uh, looking at sward diversity. First and foremost, the Water Framework Directive requires that all water bodies reach good ecological status by 2027. Currently in Ireland, approximately 57% of our rivers are meeting that status, so we need to improve upon that. We know agriculture is a significant pressure in that area. Secondly, the EU Farm to Fork uh, uh, demands that 50, a 50% reduction in nutrient losses um, to water bodies by 2030. 
And finally, then, very recently, our Climate Action Plan in 2021 has outlined the need to reduce agricultural emissions by 22 to 30 percent by 2030. And within that, specifically, actions 298 and 300 to reduce chemical nitrogen by 25 percent by 2030, and actions 302 to promote the use of legum leguminous crops. Um, this project fits very much within the context of that policy framework. So when we talk about increasing uh, diversity in our sown grasslands, I suppose, I suppose there's, it's, it's like a piece of string. How big is this or what should we do? So if we take our perennial ryegrass, our traditional perennial ryegrass swards, and we incorporate white clover into them, or indeed some other uh, grasses, clovers, and indeed some other species into the swards, I suppose there's many plants that could be considered within sown grasslands. For our purposes, in terms of, I suppose, this project, we established an expert panel to decide what would be the a sensible course of action. We've decided on these first three groups here, perennial ryegrass, perennial ryegrass, and a traditional classic white clover, and then an eight species, multi-species mix incorporating other grasses and clovers. And just to say for, for assembly members that uh, there's a huge amount of research coming out now looking at various benefits um, from increasing sward diversity. So whether we're talking about you know, yield stability in times of drought stress on our farms, increasing animal intake and performance, reducing the requirement for chemical fertilizer, which is very pertinent at the moment, um, improving milk character, reducing uh, emissions uh, from, from animals on grazing swards, building carbon in our soils, and even improving biodiversity. That there's lots of publications now showing that we can use increased sward diversity to address some of these challenges and build these extra ecosystem services into our swards, and, and that's a big motivation for this study. So specifically our research question then is, what is the impact of increasing sward diversity on pasture and animal performance, product character, and environmental outcomes within lower chemical input grazing systems? And this is a five-year project, so we're really at the, at the preliminary stages of this, and we look at the performance of animals over multiple years where they're exclusively on these different swards. In terms of the treatments, the three uh, treatments we've outlined in terms of sward is our classic perennial ryegrass sward, which is sown in 2020, 35 kilos per hectare of two high PPI recommended perennial ryegrass varieties to achieve 100% ryegrass sward. The second treatment is a classic perennial ryegrass white clover sward, again with the same two high PPI grasses and adding in white clover to achieve a 75-25 uh, ryegrass white clover uh, sward. And the third treatment on the study then is an eight species, multi-species mix, where we're incorporating the same uh, high PPI ryegrasses, but also two further grasses, Timothy and Metafescue, three different varieties of clover this time. So white clover, red clover, and Alsique clover, or hybrid clover, a third form. And a third functional group then in the form of chicory and plantain to uh, achieve an overall sward of 55% grasses, 30% clovers, and 15% 50, herbs in the sown mix. In terms of decision rules and grazing management, while there's a lot of, uh, I suppose, questions and a lot of uh, uh, science undertaken now to look at the impacts of, of management on these different swards, we're taking, I suppose, our classic perennial ryegrass sward will receive 250 kilos of N, and these uh, clover-based uh, swards, the white clover and the multi-species swards, will receive exactly half that, or 125 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per year. They will be managed in the common rotation length through mid-season, common grazing intensity at a similar stocking rate and with similar amounts of concentrate supplementation over the course of the five-year study. Just bringing you some very provisional results at this very early stage. So the animals are just being dried off at this stage, but just to give you the indications of the kind of performance in the first year of these studies. Uh, these are obviously new sown swards in 2020. All swards are achieving very high levels of animal performance, so in excess of 500 kilos of milk solids per cow. Um, you know, very high levels of fat and protein content. So, you know, between 5.3 and 5.6% fat, 3.7 to 3.8% uh, protein. Pasture productivity is very similar across the tree sward and nitrogen levels um, uh, at 12.5 uh, tons of dry matter per hectare in 2021. That's, a, I suppose, reduced a little bit because of drought overall, but also because of the receding, 25% of this area was receded in 2021 and uh, prior to receding was excluded from the from the data. Concentrate levels very, very low and silage imports very, very low. And finally, fertilizer nitrogen use during 2021, 235 kilos on the, on the perennial ryegrass and 128 and 129 kilos on the two uh, grass clover and multi-species swards. 
So just to summarize then, Siobhan, in terms of the results, very preliminary conclusions at this stage, very high levels of animal performance being observed across all of these treatments, and in particular on the lower nitrogen treatment. So that's obviously very positive for the assembly that we can do it. Um, no impact on pasture productivity, where we've taken 100 kilos of nitrogen out of the system by you know, building clover into the sward over the course of that first year of the study. Uh, we've seen substantial differences in terms of sward and also seasonal variation in terms of botanical competition. And I would say to farmers, you know, going down the road of incorporating clover or multi-species into, into your sward, that is probably a two-year process. And it's about lifting clover contents and, and herb contents in the sward over that period. And we're also seeing some very interesting results in terms of its impact on milk, milk constituents and character at a very early stage. So, you know, I suppose, uh, yeah, it's very much the starting point of the study, of the study but positive early indicators. Okay, Brendan, thank you very much for that. You can join the panel here again. Um, some very promising results coming from um, the work at Cortons and likewise at Johnstown Castle. There's been very promising results. It's early days yet, but um, looking good at the moment. And I think there's a lot of signpost farms out there potentially at the moment considering incorporating multi-species swords or clover swords next year. So I'm sure there'll be questions for, for um, uh, Brendan when we come to the Q&A. So I would encourage you to submit your, your questions to the Q&A um, at the bottom of your screen um, and we'll try to get through the, as many of them as possible. Our last presentation in this um, final part of session three um, comes from Eddie O'Reardon. Eddie is a researcher at, at Chagas Grange, and he's going to address the question of can we do, reduce aged slaughter? And if you look at the climate action plan, and one of the targets within that is to reduce aged slaughter by three months from an average of 27 months um, down to 24 months. So, Eddie, over to yourself um, to address that question of can we reduce aged slaughter? So, okay, Eddie. thank you very much, Siobhan. Can you hear me okay? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so as Siobhan said, I want to address briefly the, the whole idea of aged slaughter, and I guess earlier, earlier aged slaughter. Um, and the, was the point to, to ask is where are we right now and what are the implications uh, for that in terms of, uh, in, in terms of, of, the, of, of the future? It's probably worth starting off by saying where are we coming from? And maybe in a worldwide context, we look at where is Western Europe and we're part of that. In terms of carbon footprint, we are, we are pretty okay in that we're among the, the lowest in the world. And within Europe, if you look at Ireland, showing the green, we're also quite low. So within the Western Europe context and within the world context, we're actually quite good. But of course, reflecting the fact that Ireland is a quite a low industrial country, so the contribution that agriculture makes to greenhouse gas emissions are quite high, and that's already said by, by previous speakers. Okay, so if we're being asked then to reduce the aid to slaughter as a way forward, you know, let, let's start, where are we right now? So if we look at the actual, over the last um, 10 years, uh, from 2011 to 2020, 2020 being the last year we have a uh, slot of data for, we see that there are seven different categories of animals there. They're all either beef from the dairy herd or beef from the suckler herd. And we're seeing that there's a downward trend in age over the past uh, 10 years. On average, we're almost two months, uh, the cattle are mostly two months younger on average being slaughtered now than they were um, uh, 10 years ago, almost reducing six, six to seven days uh, per year on, on, on average, which is, which is interesting. Now, if we look at one or two of those then in particular and see where might the scope for changes be. If we look at the Frisian for the moment, they being the, the straight Holstein Frisian, uh, black and white uh, male calves coming from the dairy herd. So we're looking at the slaughter for 2020. We see the average age of slaughter uh, in 2020 was 27.6 months. But again, to make the point that they're being slaughtered now 60 days younger than they were 10 years ago. Despite being 60 days younger, we have not seen a change in carcass weight. So we're still achieving an average national carcass weight for these Frisian steers when they're slaughtered in 2020, the same now as they were back in 2011. And we see maybe a small change in the in the in the in carcass confirmation with a small drop. Now, if we can maybe then look at those in a bit detail, we'd come to the point where might we have room for improvement uh, in, in, inside in, in the system. So across the bottom axis, we have just the age of mo in months, and on the right-hand axis, we're looking at carcass weight. So again, if we look at the carcass weights at vary, various ages, so we are starting at 21, 22, 23 months of ages, and we are sharing carcass weights there 
of sort of uh, maybe under 300 kilos. And as the animal gets older, it grows. Now, the colors I'll, ex I'll explain in, in a moment. So that's in terms of carcass, carcass weight. So as they get older, they get heavier. There's no magic about that. What about the numbers? So the nine, now reading off the left-hand axis, the red line and the red text. So the, this is showing the numbers of animals being slaughtered at various age categories. So we see relatively small numbers being slaughtered at 20 uh, to 21 months of age. Uh, small, maybe peak around 24, 25, reflecting those animals being slaughtered at 24 months of age out of the shed. And then I must go back to pasture, showing with the green bars, uh, with the, sort of the peak numbers being slaughtered at around the 29 months of age, which is 28, 29 months of age, which is the, 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 sort of the, the mean figure we mentioned a while ago. And then after that, there's a drop off in numbers. But maybe worth noting that there are still 36,000 animals in 2020 that were slaughtered that were more than 30 months of age. So there must be some room to make improvements in that situation. So where might we make an improvement? We'll maybe look at the one on the left-hand side, first of all. So animals that have been slaughtered at 22 to 23 months of age, because we're talking about springborn animals, these are animals that have been in the shed for a short period of time, having a short second winter. Is there, a, is there any room to move them forward somewhat earlier to get them away earlier before they come to the shed? Now we'll talk in a minute how that might happen. The second maybe one is, which might be classified as the lower hanging fruit. So those that are being slaughtered at 30 months or older, and these are being slaughtered now at their, in their third winter, not third grazing season, but third winter. There must be an opportunity we might suggest to move them into the third grazing season at least. And within the third grazing season, are, are there animals that are slaughtered after a short period at pasture? Is there a chance to move any of those into an earlier finish by being finished inside in the shed? So that's what we're commenting, let's say, on the, the uh, Frisian steers. We could make the very same point about the suckled steers, but just to comment on that, again, the same points can be made. Here we're saying on average in 2020, in 2020 we are slaughtering steers at 45 days younger than they were 10 years ago. The actual carcass weight in the meantime has actually gone up, as has confirmation. So that's an interesting development uh, on the suckler side. But there's also a significant number of animals that are being slaughtered over 30 months of age. So the point is, so how might we move from, from an older age to a younger age? And we need to be careful how we actually do that, because we need to distinguish between change within the system, slaughtering earlier in a system, as opposed to making a change to the system. Maybe I might explain it in this slide if, if I can. So recent work done at Grange where we looked at, this was a grass a forage based system where animals were being fed a lifetime diet of grazed grass and grass silage. And we've got to look at the, th the three columns in green for the moment. So if we actually, the first, uh, column on the left, and we're going to read off the greenhouse gases on the green left hand legend for the moment. So we're late maturing suckled animals uh, being slaughtered initially at 20 months of age, where their lifetime diet is grey as grass and subsequently grass silage, no concentrates being fed. So slaughtering at 20 months of age, a carcass weight of just under 300 kilos, but a challenge to get a fat score on those animals. If those animals are not slaughtered then and they go into the shed for the winter, on this occasion, they're slaughtered at 24 months, but they're only fed grass silage, no concentrates being fed. We get another 23 or 4 kilograms of carcass and an improvement in fat score. And if at the end of that winter, they were not killed and they returned to pasture uh, for a short, maybe four-month period, and then they're slaughtered. We have we've gone to 28 months of age when they're being slaughtered with a carcass weight close to 400 kilograms and a fat score of three equals. Now, in terms of the, the savings for greenhouse gas emissions, so at 28 months of age, there's basically a four ton of CO2 uh, being produced per animal. If we down the slaughter wind, the system slaughter younger, it's back down to three. And if the slaughter younger again, it's back down to two. But of course, being much younger poses challenges in terms of carcass weight and actual carcass finish. Okay. If we want to move to a younger age of slaughter, and we take the 28 month one at the moment, that gets only uh, grass silage, grass and grass silage. And we said when they come in for the winter, we actually fed them concentrates during that final 140 or so days, maybe around four and a half kilograms per head per day, say, so maybe 500 kilograms of, of, of meal being fed for the final winter. We see actually that even though we've, they're slaughtered at 24 months of age, four months younger, 
than the than the than the, the grass-fed one. The actual carbon footprint is no different. So even though we've started them younger, there's no difference in 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 carbon footprints. So the point I'm making here is that when we looked at the green lines in a system and we started earlier, we can reduce emissions. But if you start changing the system to do something else, even though they're slightly younger, it doesn't always mean that they're actually more efficient. That's in terms of the carbon footprint in terms of per animal. But now if we look on the right-hand axis where we talk about the efficiency, which is kilograms of, of maybe of methane per kilogram of carcass produced, shown by the red dots here, we'll actually find that on the animals that went to pasture for a short third grazing season, uh, they're actually, um, efficiency is actually better than those that were killed younger. So the point I to make here is that just age of slaughter per se isn't the only point to consider how it's got there is important as part of the discussion. So in terms of the audience that, that's listening to this presentation right now, those of you who are involved in the whole idea of sustainable production of livestock, the approach, as, as Brendan said, and as Sinead said already, you know, the approach to management of managing your resource, so whether you're involved in the sustainable cattle production, be it sucklers or dairy beef, the way those cattle are managed, the way your pastures are managed, the way your feed is provided to the animal, reaching production targets along the way are all critical in achieving a sustainable production system. Part of that clearly animal health is important as is the whole area of animal genetics. So the use of animals that are either early finish, easy to finish, that are low emitters, as Sinead referred to a while ago, are all part of the arsenal that we need to have in terms of approaching a sustainable way of reducing uh, the age of slaughter. So in maybe in summary, while, and as Sinead said it a while ago, and so, so did Brendan, that while we are an efficient producer of product in the world and European context, we still have been handed out a, a share of the burden, so we have to reach some reduction targets. But probably in achieving these targets, probably increased farm efficiency along the line of what this audience is trying to do over the next few years to achieve better outputs for lower inputs and to do it in a more sustainable manner. This is how it's going to be achieved. Of course, if we can look at the low hanging fruit and start getting animals killed younger, there is an opportunity to make savings, of course there is. But the point I was trying to make, and hopefully I did, maybe I made this uh, clear, is that if we go for early slaughter, but are doing so on the back of extra food coming in in terms of maybe concentrates being fed, the extra concentrates can offset some of the savings that are being made in that situation. And finally then, so if we're going to have sustainable production and reach sort of younger age of slaughter, it then requires higher level of, of both management, animal health and genetic improvement. Thanks for that. Okay, thank you very much, Eddie, for that. Um, and I think Eddie makes a really important point there about reducing age of slaughter within a system as opposed to change in system would be where there's extra concentrates coming in. So there is a bit of a balancing act. But the bottom line is it, it still comes back to the old chestnuts of improving management, breeding, animal health. They're all fundamental to reducing our age of slaughter. So thank you very much for that, Eddie. We're going to take a couple of questions. The time is against us a little bit, so if you have any questions, please submit them. So there's a couple left coming in here. Brendan, there's a question for you here about the persistency of multi-species swords. And I know you're only in year one, but what do you expect or what's your, your, your thinking on it? So, like, they're, they're, I mean, anything clover and multi-species swords, they're, they're certainly less stable than ryegrass in terms of, you know, their composition over time and their seasonal variation in there. But, I mean, with good management and, I suppose, as part of a receding strategy, certainly I think we can stabilise them to a greater extent in our swords. And I suppose overall, in terms of persistency, I suppose I, I would see the herbs in particular, you know, if, if they can last for three, four, five years in the sward, and we've seen some evidence that they can do that. Um, that's going to be a big contribution in terms of the overall system. Mm -hmm. The clovers, I mean, we have established grass clover swards already and a big history of research in that area. So that we can be very confident that we're going to have clovers in their swards long term, you know. Okay. We will have a percentage of signpost farms this year that will con are, are considering putting in multi-species swards next year. What's the top three, very short, snappy answer, just the top three things that they need to look out for? So for me, the number one is soil fertility, as, as, as Mark outlined, you have to have really good soil fertility for a clover or multi-species sport. So getting that right, 
addressing it now, liming, building up the P's and K's, that's really, really important. Um, early, seeding, early season receding, so April, May is the best time to do it, get a good establishment and to make sure to be able to manage that and, mm -hmm. and establish the sward properly before the end of the season. And weed control then is probably the third one. In particular with multi-species swards, um, there is, you can't use sprays, post-emergent sprays on those. So I suppose making sure either picking paddocks with a low weed burden as part of the receding strategy, or I suppose addressing weed problems before, ideally in the 2020 season, if you're going to put these in in 2021, they'd be the three big, big ones. But okay. good grazing management practices. And just on specifically that. on that one last, there, there is a question here <laughs> on docks and managing docks and yeah. multi-species swards. So I suppose in, in the swards we've established with a very low burden of docks, so we haven't had uh, a dock uh, issue. There is a good bit of the uh, good number of publications, including John Finn's work at Johnstown Castle, showing that where you have multi-species swards, you know, with these mix of plants, that should suppress weeds. Yeah. So there's you know a good potential there. But at the same time, I mean, it's important to I would think for a farmer who wants to start uh, on this process to pick paddocks with a low burden okay. is certainly a great place to start because you can have good confidence then to establish the sward okay. effectively. Very good. Thanks, Brendan. Sinead, there's a question mm -hmm. here for you, for you on the economics of feed additives. Yeah, Maybe being so, used elsewhere in the world, <clears throat> what, what are the economics like? So we, we don't know a lot about that, yeah. uh, Siobhan, at this stage. We're researching the, I suppose, the efficacy of the feed additives. Um, the ones that are most promising are probably 3NOP that a lot of people have heard of. We still don't have a price point for that. Mm -hmm. um, yet we've asked on numerous occasions, even though it's been registered in South America, as many people know, um, so look, we don't we don't uh, we don't know at this stage. Uh, some are going to be cheaper than others. Some of the oils or halides are quite cheap, um, and could be part of the feed concentrate feed as it is. Um, so um, it will have to be though, I guess, um, cost effective as I said, mm. and that's going to be analysed through the National Farm Survey. But I do believe that we would have to get some kind of policy yeah. in place where it'd be a characteristic that you know that you know we would need assistance on this uh, in terms of policy. Yeah, if they're not going to provide economical yes. gain, there has to be some kind of absolutely. incentive or something absolutely. to encourage farmers and to And we are looking at the, um, you know, the, the productivity. So hopefully, yeah. like, like other strategies, particularly in the MAC, for example, that you, know, you could get a benefit, a mm. co-benefit mm. in terms of productivity. With 3NOP, we see at the moment about a 5% increase in feed efficiency. But I think you would probably need some kind of um, assistance because in, in, margins are so tight yeah. um, in, in order to get that delivered on farm. Okay. And just a second question here, mm. once you've proved the efficacy mm. of um, an additive, what are the steps to actually have getting that to market? That's a very good question. So when we've proven the efficacy, um, the companies themselves uh, would have to you know, go, go to EFSA and get approval from EFSA that the feed additive is actually safe um, and effective for it to yeah. be used. Uh, they then make a recommendation to the European Union in our case, um, and then the, the feed additive then with that evidence becomes you know, registered. Uh, that's the process which 3NOP is going through at the moment uh, with the company DSM. So <clears throat> what we do then is that's not sufficient for us. We need to have country specific trials mm -hmm. here in Ireland so that that information can get captured or incorporated into our national inventories yeah. so that we can be given credit for when that is used mm -hmm. on farms uh, across the country. And that's our ultimate aim if we can't Absolutely. get it into the national inventory. No point. No point. No point. So that, that should be our strategy. So they're the process that we need to go through. Some are further along than others. But yeah, we, uh, we, we liaise very closely with the EPA in terms of getting these uh, measures in place into national inventories. And when do you think that there <clears> might be, and oh, I'm probably pushing on yeah. this, but when do you think we might have something yeah. that would, could be incorporated into national inventories? Well, the one that's furthest along at the moment is the 3NOP. 3NOP yeah. And they're at the stage where they've had you know, a very positive result from EFSA just very recently. Uh, and that has been, there's going to be a very positive opinion, as they call it. So the European Union are going to make a decision on that probably in early 2022, where it can be used if used across the EU. Uh, what we're doing now is, and we're, we're doing a trial at Chagas Grange on that at the moment. So as soon as that's finished, we're going to, to write that up so that we can have a country specific uh, okay. study so that we can hopefully capture the, the results in our inventories. But we will have to, of course, that's in beef. We'll have to do the same in dairy. And of course, we will have to, they're developing a slow release option, which is the, the really the, the, the panacea. That's what we need yeah. here in Ireland is something like the slow release uh, or else early life feeding that we can actually carry out these mitigation strategies um, during the grazing season. Okay, great. Thanks, Sinead. Uh, Eddie, just one or two questions for, for you here. How far can we push reduce the age of slaughter without affecting carcass weight and in particular fat, fat cover? Okay, I think that, that's a fair point. Um, that's a fair question to ask. I think at the moment, uh, looking at the fat scores for the various categories of animals that we are slaughtering, uh, the one that would come to mind, first of all, probably is the late maturing uh, steers. 
and that the challenge for them is some of those very lean animals that are very efficient and indeed some machine aids work suggesting that they are also low emitters uh, of, uh, of greenhouse gases that to get them to a, an acceptable fat score may well be a challenge. And maybe one of the things we might discuss at some stage is that maybe the criteria to set for what is the minimum fat score might need to be looked at as well. Because if maybe if we're saying maybe a two or two plus sig of argument might be seen as a minimum fat score, if that was to be able to change to, to, a, to a, a two equal sig of argument, um, that might make a big difference in when an animal would be fit to slaughter and might be an aid to help things move along. I suppose the animal biology is such that as animals sort of uh, grow older and in, reach mature size, fatness gets deposited. So obviously the younger we're going to slaughter, the, the greater the challenge will always be to have sufficient fatness on the animal. So I think we could do maybe to sort of have a, a, a ruling or a decision on maybe making it easier to get them away would also help, I think, in reducing the age at, at, at slaughter. So possibly looking at that metric around fatness in the context of reducing age of slaughter. Absolutely, okay. yeah. All right. Thank you, Eddie, for that. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to draw this session to a close. It's been quick fire, um, but I think we've had good engagement, um, six very good presentations, and quite varied, but related at the same time. And they're all around carbon, carbon storage, and, and methane reductions, and obviously reducing our, our chemical in requirement. Um, so I want to thank our, our seven, seven speakers in this sec section. So Annie East and Catherine, who joined us from, from France, um, Lillian and Mark in the earlier session, and in this session, then Sinead, Brendan uh, and Eddie. And I want to thank them, thank them for the effort they've put into keeping their presentations to seven or eight minutes, because it's not easy to present material that they have in such a short space of time. So I just want to thank them for that. Um, overall, just to, to close the, the General Assembly for this year, it wasn't what we were expecting to be doing. We had hoped to have a face-to-face -face session with yourselves as signpost farmers and also partners and our own Chagas colleagues, but obviously with COVID restricted us in doing that. Um, but we've had three um, good sessions between last night and the two sessions this morning. The content of each of those will be available online and out through our social media platforms in the next short while. And I think there's some very useful presentations as well. All those presentations will be available on our website at www.chagas.ie forward slash signpost. So just keep an eye out for those. We will be circulating them in the next short while. I have one, two people in particular in this room that I want to thank for, for putting this production together. There's a lot of work involved in it. In particular, I want to thank Declan McArdle and Porrick O'Connor. You never see them at the front of the camera, but they put a huge amount of work into putting this kind of a session together. Um, if you go into the RTE studios, you'd have multiples of these two people uh, putting this kind of a production together. So in particular, thank you to them for what they, what they have done. Um, over the last 36 hours and, and beyond in putting this together. So all that's left for me to do is thank you for, for attending these sessions over the last two days. Um, thank you for your engagement. And all that's left to say is wish you all a very happy Christmas and all the best in 2022. Thank you very much.